welcome to Still Speak Podcast. So I have breaking news. No, I really don't. I have absolutely no breaking news about the Gabby Petito case. But wow, YouTube true crime channels are really running with this breaking news on all of their titles. There was one yesterday I saw that was breaking news. Christopher Laundrie is mowing his lawn. Mowing his lawn? You mean like grass? You know, when you like take a little machine and you push it up and down? That's breaking news? That's not breaking news, guys. It's not breaking news. But because I'm following the case, I want to keep myself informed. So, of course, I give them the click. And then within like three seconds, I was pissed off. That's just what it is. Um, because this dude is out there. It was early morning, but still already hot for where he is. Sun beaming down on him. He's older. He's out there. He knows that before he walked out that door, that these reporters were going to be all on him while he's mowing the lawn. But he still went out there and did it rather than to hire somebody. And he's just trying to mow his dang lawn. And they're following him up and down where the grass meets the road like they were watching some dog crossing the street and they're just asking all these questions and all he's trying to do is mow his freaking lawn and you know I hear the strategy is all off people don't react too aggressive or hostile you're more likely to get a response from somebody if you are kind um understanding and respectful and then they want to speak with you now not everybody because with cassie it did take protesters getting her to come outside and con- you know confront them But that was only like after three days of doing that to her. So she caved really quickly, okay? And it was mostly to protect her children. This is different because these parents, you know, everything's been done. There's been an airplane over their house. There's been posters hammered into their lawn, flowers delivered to the home, people banging on their door, dog the bounty hunter banging on their door, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And nothing they have not caved to speaking at all so clearly that same strategy is not working with them as it did cassie and i made a comment i was kind of being funny but not really and i said what probably would have worked is if somebody mowed their lawn or hired somebody for them to mow their lawn and that way they would be forced to come outside to see who did it or who paid for it to be done so they can thank them. And then you, you know, make nice and see if you can get them to answer at least one question. Who knows? Nothing else has worked. So all of the other things have just been big failures. You never know. And I do want to note this because I think this is important and everybody wants to talk about the bad. Let's talk about the good for a second here. He actually did some weed whacking around the memorial for uh, Gabby that's at the end of their lawn by the street. He didn't touch any of the items. He was very careful and he cleaned up all around it. Also, Brian Enson said that he saw him move some of the flowers over to the side that had been left outside the home, but he thinks that he only did that so that he can clear a path to the front door, and he didn't touch them. He didn't bring them inside. He didn't throw them away. Nothing. He left them. And the other day, I said that Dog returned to Colorado because he uh, sustained an injury. Apparently, his injury is better, and he actually is still in Florida. He had a change of mind, and he went past Cassie's home. I believe it was yesterday because it was her birthday, but she never did come to the door. The coroner gave a interview with several reporters in which he was asked about the domestic violence comment that he made during his press conference that caught everybody's attention. And I think it was rather clear that it was a slip up. But I said to you in my video about the autopsy, I said, you know, but he probably won't get in trouble for that because you can easily explain away that comment and say it was something else. 
So he was asked about it, and he said that it was an assumption. Which, come on, you know, he did the autopsy. He knows what um, a sort of domestic violence wounds would look like. So, uh, yeah. Then again, maybe he was just going off of the Moab, Utah stop, and it just kind of came out. Who knows? But I knew that it was going to be easily explained away, and I absolutely anticipated reporters asking him to clarify that because it caught everybody's attention. Something else I wanted to address, there is several former FBI agents who have been weighing in on the case as contributors on, you know, news stations. And there was one, I'm not going to give her name, I'm not calling her out or anything, I just have to disagree with her slightly, and I hate to do that because then people are going to be like, well, you're not a former FBI agent. I, I get that, but you have to remember this person is speaking based on opinion, okay, just like I am. So, I have a little pushback here. They said that, you know, the attorney has repeatedly said he is representing the family and that he is representing Brian Laundry. You would not represent someone who is not alive. And I kind of took this as implying they know he's alive. And that's why this lawyer keeps saying it's his client. But if they don't know whether he's alive or dead, he's still his client until it's proven he is dead. Once he is dead, then yeah, he wouldn't be no longer his client. But this argument that he keeps referencing Brian as his client, and so therefore they know he's alive, or at least the lawyer knows this. Eh, No, he was hired to represent Brian prior to Brian going quote-unquote missing. They don't know where he is, and therefore he's still his client until it's proven. That's the way I see it. After a week of uh, a lot of silence, there was some activity in the Carlton Reserve again today. And when it's quiet, it's not necessarily that they're not out there, just that we didn't see them or the helicopters didn't see them out there. Uh, because you remember, this is 25,000 acres, so I mean, they could be out there and we wouldn't know about it. And they were using a canine that detects human remains. This is not the first time they've been out there. They've been out there before, so this is not something new. But people often, you know, they, they see a title of an article or they read one line and they, you know, immediately jump to conclusions. And initially, when this information came out this morning, many people thought that they found human remains out in Carlton Reserve. And so this was a big rumor, and all the groups were like, stop it! They didn't find human remains! They're using canine to find human remains. So that ended pretty quickly. And I listened to a pretty interesting uh, view on the case today on another channel while I was shopping. Um, food shopping. I just needed something to listen to. And uh, so I had my earbud in and I was listening to it. And it was definitely not anything that I agreed with. But I think it's really important to not only listen to what you agree with, but to also listen to things that you don't agree with. It challenges you. It makes you think about your opinion further. It helps you to analyze better. If you're just constantly listening to listening to what you agree with i mean it's just an echo chamber right so if i go to a channel where it's all bashing of the parents that's just all you're gonna you know be feeding your brain with you're not gonna get any opposing type views that's gonna kind of challenge your thinking and vice versa now this person actually has very similar views on true crime cases that I do as far as media narratives and falsely accusing someone, uh, becoming a mob against somebody, etc. That being said, what I didn't agree with this person about was they were talking about currently the idea that Brian didn't do anything to Gabby. Now, back on September 
13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and even, you know, up until what point that she was found and we found out it was homicide, which was on the 21st. I would have said, okay, and I did. I had many, many videos. If you've not seen my other videos about Gabby's case, please go back. You can listen to them. I went through every theory. I considered all possibilities. I didn't just come quickly to the media narrative and come up with my opinion. I went through them all. And I sat back and I listened to other people's and I read them. And then I thought about them and I applied my thinking to it. And then I came to pre basically a process of elimination. Like, okay, well, it's not that. Okay, well, that theory is not going to work. Okay, what about this theory? Does this theory fit the facts? Nah, 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 nah. That doesn't make no sense. Cross it off. And I just was doing the process of elimination. And right before Gabby was found deceased, I basically had already come to that conclusion that there's no way she's alive, and he most definitely probably is involved. Because I'm not a media narrative person at all. Not at all. Uh, and what I am actually seeing in the media, besides a select few, uh, I would say the WFLA and News Nation have been rather kind and not biased towards uh, the parents of Brian Laundry. Now, they don't necessarily love them, <laughs> but they recognize that as of right now, there's no evidence to say they're involved. Yes, you can think that their behavior is suspicious, but you know, to go around doing X, Y, Z to them is really not appropriate. But beyond these two main people who are covering this case or these, you know, news stations, it's pretty bad out there <laughs> as far as the attacks on the parents. You got Nancy Grace, who, oh God, I used to love back in the day. I don't know what the hell I was thinking because she is one of the most biased person I have ever, oh my Lord. I think it was just because I was young and I had really little experience at that time in true crime. And now that I've had so much personal uh, experiences with people involved in crimes and then following crimes, I think I can't even listen to her, to be honest with you. I just can't. Um, so she's been going at the parents heavily. You got John Walsh going, wow, too far sometimes in what he's saying. Uh inappropriate things. Uh, John Walsh in his day was amazing. Oh my gosh. I remember as a kid, we used to watch him on the show. And what happened to his son? Oof, horrific, absolutely horrific story. But I think maybe it's time he retires because there's a lot of things that are coming out of his mouth that seem a little, mm, I don't know, a little unstable. I mean, he went into... Gabby being brutally beaten and, you know, this whole theory, which, I mean, <laughs> he wasn't at the autopsy. Nobody has that information. Why are you going on national television making these types of statements? Because the problem is, is that, oh God, and I went through this in my Summer Well series, but I know that if nobody cares about the Summer Well series, you're not going to go even go bother listening to this, but I went on and on and on about when somebody's in that type of position that people look to you and think, oh my God, it's John Walsh. He's so credible. He's so this. He's, okay. That's makes what they say important. What do I mean by that? Meaning you need to be careful with your words. Me, I don't have to be careful. I have a small little channel on YouTube, right? The only thing I need to be careful with was, you know, not being slapped with a defamation lawsuit. So I'm very careful about, in my opinion, in my view, personally, etc. right? But when you're somebody that like, people believe are credible, they take your words as facts, so even if you're on TV and you're given this full theory, they're going to think that's a fact because, oh, he must have slipped up. He knows something we don't know. And then they start circulating that. Okay. So he has a higher bar, a higher standard than most. So it's actually really irresponsible to go around inciting a mob against this family, the parents, to 
talk about how Gabby was killed before anybody even knew what her autopsy showed. Like, why would you, why would you even go there? Theorize, sure, but the way he explained it was just craziness. Talking about her being brutally beaten. Again, he's on TV. He's John Walsh. You need to be more careful. So, I can't really watch him. I know everybody's, like, glued to him. I can't do it. And then Ashley Banfield, I don't know how many people know this, but Ashley Banfield was actually fired in the middle of the Chris Watts case from HLN. She was hugely involved in the beginning of the Chris Watts case. But what happened was there was this troll who said that he had an affair with Chris Watts. And that, you know, Chris Watts was buying him lip injections and all this other stuff. So he was implying that Chris was gay and that he found him on, I think it was Tinder. Anyway, she ends up giving this guy a platform and brings him on his show. It caused, oh my God, the drama it caused in all the groups. And shortly after that, with really no explanation as to why... She was fired. And what do you know? We find out later that the FBI investigated that guy and spoke to that guy and his story was a bunch of BS. People think that because somebody's on the news or because the news is covering a source or a witness or whoever, that that means that it must be legit. No, it's not up to these channels to investigate these people. That's up to law enforcement. These people are just giving them platforms to speak, okay? And if it later turns out to be whatever, then you can be like, well, we just, he said that, so we let him speak on our station. And I don't know what happened with Ashley, but I do know that it wasn't long after that guy was on her show that she suddenly was fired right in the middle of the Chris Watts case. I didn't even know she was still on TV until I saw her connected to this case. I'm like, wait a minute, Ashley, where the hell are you? What? 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 I was so confused because I, I remember how much she was involved with it and then poof, fired. So you have these three big names, John Walsh, Nancy Grace, and Ashley Banfield. And they're like, the parents, the parents. Every single night. So the mob's like, yeah, yeah. And you're getting them all geared up and cheering it on, right? Because you're inciting this uh, this mob because people look to these people as credible. They look to them as, well, if they're saying they they're must be involved, then they must be involved. Because, I mean, ugh, it's Nancy Grace. Come on. No. <laughs> no. It's just them spewing their opinion too, right? The only difference is they bring on experts and and have the resources to do that and the contacts to do that. But what they speak is just their opinion based on their experience following true crime cases, which is just like me. I have many, many years of following true crime cases and I come on here and I spew words out of my mouth based upon my experience. It's my opinions. A lot of times, it's actually not my opinions, but I like to throw out possibilities and make people think. And that's what I find so funny. I was telling my mom this, because she was like, I wonder how many people hear your videos of you defending the parents and like, you know, they get annoyed with you or roll your eyes. And I was like, you know what? I really don't care because I'm not even saying that I fully believe all the possibilities that I've thrown out to you to explain the parents' behaviors. My whole point in that was that there are possibilities that can make sense and fit. And I want to get you thinking. You don't really see that on shows like Ashley or Nancy. You don't, there's not a whole lot of getting you to critically think. There's not a whole lot of, you know, helping you to analyze things and information. It's giving you the facts. If they get their facts right, sometimes they don't. And then, you know, a whole bunch of just regurgitated statements being made over and over every single night that sticks to one side. Once I kind of broke free from the Nancy Grace way years ago, and I followed her heavily, 
heavily through Scott Peterson. Oh my god, I was obsessed with Scott Peterson. Okay. And Nancy Grace. I remember my husband, who wasn't my husband at the time, but we were dating. And he'd come in the living room and be like, oh god, Nancy's on the TV again? Yep. <laughs> you damn straight. And then I kind of sort of followed her with Casey Anthony, but then she started getting on my nerves with that because the whole top mom and she went heavy for Casey Anthony. However, I agreed with that 100%. I think most people believe Casey Anthony is you know, guilty. Unfortunately, they just couldn't prove that. But uh, I am not a fan of Casey Anthony by any means. But I still felt her coverage of her was too much dramatic. If I can't really think of the, per- the perfect word to explain it. It's kind of just like, okay, we get it. Top mom. She killed her kids. Like, we know. We all know. And after that point, so I was like in my mid-20s at that point. It was just prior to me having my first child. And so at that point, I started to explore other cases that weren't covered on mainstream. And, you know, in addition to mainstream And then I just, my thinking started to change. Like, I just started to form, I guess I would say, my own opinions. And not what the TV was telling me that my opinion was. And I started just viewing things differently. And I started to really enjoy looking at both sides of a case and considering all those possibilities. I think it's so key. And it really makes you think. And I like that. And after this process... It's what allowed me to now consider other possibilities involving the Scott Peterson case. If you would have met me back when I followed the Scott Peterson case, I would have told you, are you out of your freaking mind? This dude is 10,000% guilty. There's no question about it. I despised the man. I felt, felt he was arrogant and smug. I couldn't stand him. Okay. But I recently watched the Hulu documentary, and even though I still think he's guilty, I cannot lie to you. And I said this in my Summer Well series. I had to stop the video while I was watching it, one of the episodes, because I was like, oh my god, I can't believe that I'm actually sitting here considering him being possibly innocent right now. That's how I felt. Like, I just couldn't even believe it because I was always so dead set on his guilt. And, but I was able to. I felt that they put a really compelling show together. It really was. I was making notes and I was like, all right, all right, all right. Hold on, hold on. And then I allowed all the information that I watched to kind of uh, go to my brain's bank of memories back to the case and then I was like okay well that I don't agree with and this I do agree with okay and that can't be possible but he still took the boat out there and that's where her body was found and it was Christmas why was he fishing on Christmas come on and so I was kind of playing this mental war in my brain right because in my head I was so convinced of his guilt and there was the other side of me that was just like oh maybe he's innocent and I'm like no no he's guilty So, you know, I was going back and forth and I was fighting against it, but I took the time and I processed my thoughts and I was comparing, you know, what they were saying to what I knew about the case and I knew everything about that case. And, you know, while I still do absolutely think that he's guilty, not absolutely, let me correct that. I used to think he was 10,000% guilty and now I would say I'm a probably about 75% to 80% that he's guilty. And so, yeah. So I like that. I like that. I like the challenging of my brain to get me to view cases differently, to consider things. It just really opens your eyes to so many things. So anyway, back to the channel I was listening to today. So her and I have very similar views 
on how to approach true crime cases. And despite that, what she was saying, I at this point don't agree with what she's saying at all. If she made that video before Gabby was found deceased and we found out it was homicide, I would have been like, yeah, I would have been cheering her on. But at this point, after much, much analysis that I've done about this case on this channel, I can't get on board with the idea at this point that Brian is not involved in the death of Gabby Petito. So I'm out there with the rest of the mob, okay? On that, on that point, that, that Brian is involved in her death. What I'm not a part of is the mob of people who also believe that the parents are 100% involved, that they know what he did, that they helped him escape, or they helped him to hide. Key word here is at this point, I do not believe the parents are involved. That being said, I can be wrong, okay? Absolutely, I can be 100% wrong. And if I'm wrong, I will be like, oh, well, okay. But there's nothing for me right now, evidence-wise, to show me that that it that they are involved with him uh, escaping and hiding or that they're helping him. There is far more circumstantial stuff against Brian Laundrie to believe that he's involved in her death than it is the suspiciousness, I guess you can say, I don't even know if it's a word, of the parents. And while I may not agree that the parents are involved, I still am able to understand why some people believe that they are. But the people who do believe that they're involved aren't able to understand why other people don't think that. And I know that because if I make a comment in a group where I say, we don't know if they're cooperating or not. We don't know what they know. We don't blah, 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 right? Anytime I make that statement in a group, I don't even check my replies because I know what the replies are. I don't even need to look. I'm not even going to engage in that. But you can tell because people will laugh at the comments, even though what I'm saying is actually factual. It's fact. We don't know. You think you know. We don't know. They could be cooperating. We don't know. They could be involved. We don't know. So it's a bit, you know, close-minded to not want to say, okay, well, I think they're involved, but... Let me hear this person out and why they don't think they are, right? But I can do that for them. I can be like, well, I don't think they're involved, but I understand why you think they could be. At this point, um, listen, they're desperate to find Brian. Other fugitives, low-profile cases that nobody knows about, they're not going to be as desperate. Right now, law enforcement is rather freaking desperate to find this man, okay? Look at how, many t how much time they spent in the Carlton Reserve. They know how high profile this is, how it's on every news station every night, and that they need to find him dead or alive. They're desperate to find him. And by this point, all their forensic type of stuff would have came back, like what was on computers, what was on... Um, cell phones or what have you. I don't know what they've you know ran because we don't know. They haven't told us that. Then I think that if the parents were involved, they would have been arrested already. That's just my opinion. And that's also because the other day I was curious, so I started looking up cases where parents helped somebody, and every case I found, they were arrested within a few days of helping them to escape. And I started some research earlier, but I didn't have time to finish it because I went food shopping today, and that takes up hours, and then, yeah, you know how it goes. And so I started to, and then I ran out of time, but I was looking at basically what Brian would need in order to stay hidden for a period of time. And I was doing it for each location, whether he's in the Appalachian Trail or if he's in the Carlton Reserve or if he went back to some of the places they went to on their cross-country trip 
or if he went to, I believe it was Washington that he talked about there being an organic farm there that they were going to work on. Uh, so I was trying to kind of go from place to place to place to kind of see what he would need. And one of the biggest factors was from prior fugitives was he's going to need money funds. We don't know what, how much he took from Gabby's card. It said, you know, thousand. We don't know if it's more than that. Was it 2000? Was it 3000? We don't know. And a couple of thousand dollars is only going to last you so long, right? So at some point he would need to be supplied some form of money. And with the way this family is under the watch of the FBI and Northport and different county law enforcement and the media, etc., um, which the media can't do anything, so let's exclude them. I don't know why I said that. They're, if they're funneling money to him, that's going to be found. Period. End of story. Whether it's Western Union, PayPal, Venmo, Facebook Messenger... <laughs> Uh, transfer, it, that's money trail, and, and it's going to be found. And I doubt the dude loaded up his backpack with, you know, $30,000 or forty, fifty, and even that, you can't, that's only going to last so long. I still believe he's alive. When this first began, I was like, oh, he's going to end up being dead. Then as time went on, I'm like, no, 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 you know what? I think he's alive. I do. I think he's alive. I still think he's alive. I don't think what other people think. I don't think he's in Mexico. I don't think he's in Cuba. I mean, he could be in another country, but I don't know. And the reason I don't think Mexico is because right now there's a lot going on at the border. If you look at the news, okay, a lot. There's tons of media. State legislators are going there. Congressmen and most everybody is trying to come in to America, not go to Mexico. And I don't think that, and I'm going to be frank here, hope you don't have any kids around, but I don't think Brian has the balls, honestly, to walk past Mexican cartels on his way to Mexico. I don't think he has it in him. As far as Cuba, I mean, like I know a lot of people think like he took a canoe to Cuba. I mean, that it, 90 miles in a canoe? No. Now, have some people hopped on a float and come out from Cuba? Yeah, but that's, you know, not everybody makes it here if they attempt to do that. Nah, I think he just went and hid. And I also think he's actually rather close. He's either two things. I think he's either close by and somewhere he's very familiar with, or he went back to a place that he visited with Gabby and is recently, currently um, knowledgeable about that particular place because he had to research it for their trip. And with COVID and all that other stuff, I don't know what the current guidelines for Canada is and all that other stuff. I think that if he would have crossed the border into Canada, we know about that too, especially if he had to do a, a test. I need to look it up, but I'm currently in the middle of that research. And I said before in my other videos, but I'll say it again, uh, I think that if he killed himself, we would know about that by now. And the only way I think that if he's dead, it wasn't because he intended to be dead. Like something happened. Suicide is you usually want to be found so people know you're dead. Okay. And, and I said in my other videos, like he had the chance to kill himself after whatever happened with Gabby right there. He could have killed himself on the way home, he jumped in front of a car on the freaking highway going 90 miles an hour. He could have jumped off a bridge on the way home. He could have taken a gun that was in the home and shot himself in his bedroom. He could have walked into the Carlton Reserve, stepped off to the side, and blew his brains out right there. I don't think he like went all the way into the Carlton Reserve and shot himself, never to be found. And he also didn't seem to take items that if you found those items, you would know, um, it, you know, he was dead. Like a phone. So if he is dead, then it, then it was some kind of the elements did it to him type of situation, I think. But it's interesting because Brian Empton interviewed Josh Taylor, which Josh Taylor is kind of on my, my shit list right now. Sorry, Josh. No offense, but you are. 
because he was the one who kept saying that they saw Brian on the first contact. They saw Brian on the first contact. You heard me say this a thousand times because now it's recently it came out like, oopsie, no, we didn't. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Thanks for that. But um, he, Josh recently told Brian Enton that they haven't found anything in the Carlton Reserve uh, connected to Brian. Now, did he just say that because he couldn't share what they know or found? Sure. But, like, why answer the question at all? <laughs> and I know that when he first went, quote-unquote, missing, that he mentioned during a press conference that they were trying to corroborate um, the parents' story, right? And so I would think that they did, and they found something that led them to believe the parents' story. Why else would they still be in the Carlton Reserve? We're going on. Oh my god. So, he was reported missing on the 17th of September. And they started the search the 18th. So, you have the 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, October 1st, October 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th. I don't even know what day it is. What day is today? (laughs) I've lost all track of everything. Okay. So, we're on, you know day 20 so day 26 of them searching for him that's not how long he's been gone allegedly he's been gone since the 13th of september so that's the 31 days okay but they've been searching for him 26 days so clearly they have something maybe i don't know maybe he was caught on a camera entering the reserve on the day that the parents said but maybe not because then they just recently changed that day i don't know i don't know why they're still there i don't know why they're spending millions of dollars and all these resources to be in the carlton reserve still and we don't know if they're searching other places because we don't they haven't told us that we just know about the carlton reserve so what is it Do you have something or don't you have something? Are you still just wasting time hoping that he's just eventually going to pop up? I don't know. I know it's getting old at this point because it's like, all right, where the hell is this dude? This is ridiculous. This guy can't be that freaking smart. And I just don't think that he is smart. I don't. I think he's just this punk 23-year-old kid. Because the smart thing to do would have been to disappear from Wyoming and just let people assume that they went missing together and assume that they're dead eventually if they were never found. And he didn't do that. He came back. This makes no sense. The only thing that makes sense to me is that he wanted to see his family before he took off again. But seriously, like, come, come all the way back for that? I don't know. And I seen a report tonight talking about how the parents took the Mustang up from the reserve and why would they do that if it was his only transportation home from the reserve i mean i don't think that's a big deal because i mean if he's in there hiking why can't he just hike home it's not you know unbelievably far and if some people actually thought he was hitchhiking 25 miles up in grand teton why couldn't you also believe that he'd just hike home from the reserve or hike to a store and call his parents and be like hey you took the car i need to come home you know so i don't think that really says much to be honest and it did get a notice on it about it being towed and on this report it was said you know these parents aren't acting like grieved parents you're not seeing them every second of every moment they're in their home like almost 24 7 you see them in little small three second clips of them walking from their door to their car and then back again and that's not indication of anything you can't go off that i could be bawling in my house wipe my tears off my face walk out to my car and walk back in with a smile on my face and you would have no clue that i was just bawling my eyeballs out from afar you wouldn't have no idea so that doesn't even really mean anything and i think that thinking is so skewed because you're missing the whole context behind it and you think just because you're not seeing it on camera means that it's not happening at all. And that's just not fair. But I'm going to end on this. I actually 
while I was doing some research to figure out what Brian would need to escape to certain areas and stay hidden, I stumbled on this article from Vice, and it's from 2017. And they actually spoke with current and former fugitives. And some of the things, and I just briefly scrolled through it, so I just want to read some of you, uh, some of the things from it. And uh, I may go more into this in another video when I do more research, but... He was talking to one and and he says, this person, this fugitive said, you don't realize how much of your life is spent looking at shit on your phone until you have to throw that phone in a river. And it says that after he ditched his phone and his iPad, he left his parents home wearing his dad's clothes and never looked back. Living in an undisclosed location with a friend, he knows that his days are numbered, but is terrified of going to prison. And this particular fugitive fugitive said, I know I can't run forever, but I can't face going inside. Not now. Not after all this. I haven't spoken to my parents or anybody, and I've made this worse for myself. Another fugitive took his family on the run with him, And one day, this man's wife basically gave him an ultimatum and said, I can't do this anymore. I haven't done anything wrong, and I can't live like this any longer. And this man, you know, chose to turn himself in. And this stood out to me because if, you know, his parents are helping him, Brian, okay, they're basically living the life of a fugitive as well. Because they're not hidden, although kind of, in their home. But they're not on the run. If they're helping him in any way, then they're constantly having to live like they are not helping him when they really are. So they have to be careful where they go and who they speak to and how they transfer money. And that gets really tiring after a while. Because in the grand scheme of it, they're not the ones who killed Gabby Petito. Another fugitive said, quote, the most important thing is to not have a direct contact with your family. They will monitor them, knowing that sooner or later, you'll get in touch with them. That's how they catch most people. You have to be disciplined, unquote. And he goes further into being disciplined, and he says that he basically emptied out his bank account before he went on the run, and eventually he was running out of money and you know he took with him initially all the physical money he could but he was like you can only carry so much which goes back to what i was saying earlier and i said that before i read this quote eventually you need to replenish your funds the loss of earnings hits you and that's when things get even more risky because now you have to contact people from your old life or work with Uh, new people. Neither are ideal when you're trying to keep a low profile. Frying pan or fire? That's what one fugitive said. And one of them was asked, what was the hardest part about life on the run? And he said it was getting the fear of getting caught. Which, right? You're because you're constantly on edge, right? You're peering over your shoulder. You're making sure you're not getting your caught on a camera in a store you're worried about using any type of cash and somebody recognizing your hands i mean you're constantly worried this article was from 2017 i said yep 2017 march of 2017 so this was pre-covid these fugitives okay so they didn't have the luxury of being able to walk around in a mask without anybody thinking they were freaking crazy like Brian does. He has that luxury now, and that's so huge. You only see his eyeballs. And then I stumbled on another article where it talked about um, that a lot of states won't even chase down a fugitive if they cross state lines, not even for murder because of the cost. And I was like, no way. Uh, There's a whole report that backs this up and it shows that this is actually true in some places and it's just really costly i don't think that's going to be the case here i think they're very desperate 
to find Brian and t- bring this to an end because you have to remember the FBI, Northport, and every other agency connected to this case is getting constant hammering from the public and the media. So the quicker they can find him, dead or alive, the quicker it ends for them. I really doubt that they would not cross state lines to find Brian Laundrie and bring him back. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case in this story. It's just too high profile for that. Maybe like the little cases that nobody really knows about. Okay, I can see that happening. Like, okay, but not this one. So yeah, I'm going to kind of work on that. I'm going to work on, uh, you know, different places that he could have gone, what he would have needed for each of those specific places. I know people are really dead set on the Appalachian Trail. And hey, you know, it could be. Uh, But we're talking about 2,100 miles of trail. It takes five to seven months to uh, actually hike all of it. So, I mean, that's a lot of freaking miles. So that's why I said good luck finding him there if that's the case. But what was funny about that, when I started looking that up, I found a case from 2000, I think it was 15. My mom called me when I was reading it. uh, And uh, this fugitive actually hit out on the Appalachian Trail for a really long time. And he was actually very well known to people. And everybody thought he was like this really normal, friendly guy. And they had no idea he was a fugitive. So that was really interesting when I stumbled on that. I was like, wait, what? (laughs) And then my mom's like, well, they probably don't have like TVs or anything out there. So nobody even knew or saw this guy's face before. So he was able to live out there. She's right. Could be. That could explain it. Anyway, that's it for tonight for the Gabby Petito case. There really wasn't anything else. There's been like a whole bunch of little minor things that really aren't necessary to discuss. And we go into day 32 since Brian Laundrie allegedly left his parents' Northport home. We shall see what the weekend brings and next week brings, but I wouldn't hold your breath, folks. This could take a while. Maybe I just jinxed it and it'll actually be sooner. Huh. I sure hope so, because I want nothing more than for them to find him and alive. I want to see his reaction to being caught. I want to see what he looks like now, especially if he's been out in the Carlton Reserve for a freaking month. I'm sure he's pretty stink and dirty, really dirty, possibly full of mud. Who knows? Share his picture. I know people are getting sick of the case and they're just like, oh, this case again. Share his picture. You would be surprised. Even though this story is one of the most high profile cases I've seen in quite some time. There's definitely people out there who have no idea what he looks like. And we just got to keep sharing that picture over and over and over again. And yes, I think he most likely has a hat and mask on. But when you share it, make sure you share Ones that include his tattoos, what his hands look like, uh, put a link to the Moab, Utah video so people can get his mannerisms and whatnot. So uh, just keep sharing it. That's, that's really all we can do. And I see so many of these YouTube channels like, we're trying to get justice for Gabby. No, we're not trying to get justice for Gabby. Us talking on the internet isn't going to do anything. When she was missing, we were helping. At this point, we're not helping. Unless we're out there physically looking for Brian Laundry in the Appalachian Trail, on the Great Sand Dunes, in Grand Teton, in Yosemite, or out in Washington on this organic farm Brian was talking about, or in Fort DeSoto. Yeah, then you're helping. You're physically out there doing something. We all can't do that, obviously. The next best thing to that is sharing his poster the same way we shared her poster, but with different motives. But just sitting here on YouTube talking, that's not trying to get justice for Gabby. It's just not. It's just not doing anything. So I don't even know why people are saying that. Leaving posters outside a parent's house is not getting justice for Gabby. Buying planes over their home, not getting justice for Gabby. Finding Brian equates to getting justice for Gabby. 
we can only do so much. We're not law enforcement and we're not privy to what they have and what information they have that can help guide us. So that's that. Have a wonderful night. Until next time.